not a con. Okay, uh, welcome to my talk today. I'm speaking on cryptanalysis of hash functions. Uh, my name is Matthew Fanto. I currently work for the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, we're the government agency responsible for the SHA-1 hash function. So, uh, a few things that I'm going to talk about today is uh, hash function basics and how hash functions are actually constructed. Then I'm going to discuss the recent attacks against hash functions, which I'm sure you all have heard of if you follow any news sites. And finally, I'm going to talk about NIST response to, to these attacks. So what is a hash function? It's a one-way mapping that transforms an arbitrary finite input to a fixed size output. And what this means is it just takes a message of any size and it computes a fixed sized output, a digest of it. Uh, it's important to distinguish between uh, the type of hash function that I'm speaking about. And those are cryptographically secure hash functions and hash functions used in other areas of computer science. Uh, during this talk, we, mean, we strictly mean cryptographically secure. Uh, the term one way implies that given an input, it's easy to compute the output. So you, know, you have a message, it's really easy to compute the, the hash of the message. But given a hash, it's computationally infeasible to find the, the input that produced that output. And thus, it's one way. You, know, you can only compute in one direction. Okay. Uh, why do we need hash functions? Hash functions are some of the most versatile cryptographic primitives. You know, block ciphers are generally used only for encryption. You, know, you have RSA in that, which is used for signatures and public key operations. But hash functions can be used for pretty much everything. Uh, it's mostly used for message integrity to ensure files haven't been modified. Um, but it's also used for random number generation. Uh, the Linux kernel uses SHA-1 in dev random. Um, it's used for authentication. It uh, can be used for encryption as a stream cipher. It's used everywhere. One of the most common uses of hash functions is uh, to store passwords. And this is because hash functions are, in fact, well, we believe they are one way. So you can store, instead of storing the user's actual password, you can simply store a hash of the password. If your password file was later compromised, if someone managed to grab a copy of it, uh, they wouldn't be able to actually invert the hashes and find the original password. So it makes for a nice password storing scheme. Okay, how do most f hash functions work? I say most because really there's only two widely used hash functions, and that's MD5 and SHA-1. I don't have any actual statistics, but I would venture to say probably close to 100% of hash function users are using either MD5 or SHA-1. So it's probably a safe assumption to say how do all hash functions currently work. Um, so throughout this entire talk, we're going to let n denote the size of the output. So in the case of MD5, for example, uh, MD5 has a 128-bit output, so n would be 128 bits. Um, we're going to let b denote the internal block size. Uh, usually b is bigger than n. You know, when SHA-1 or MD5 operates on a message, it expands the message uh, and works on 512 bits at a time and compresses these 512 bits down to the block size. So hash functions start with a, a, fixed, you know, a fixed IV. Uh, it's defined in the standard as to what this IV should be. The IV is copied to internal registers and then the hash function actually begins. So it works by breaking the message up into block sizes of B bits um, again, as in the case of MD5 and SHA-1, uh, these blocks are 512 bits in, in size. It needs to pad the last block to be a multiple of the block size. You know, so if your message is only 511 bits, then it needs to, to pad out to uh, 512 bits. So next, uh, a compression function is applied to the messages, which transforms the 512 bits down to the output size. So SHA-1 will take this block of 512 bits and compress it down to 160 bits. Uh, it then updates the IV. It combines this compressed block with, with the IV somehow and 
moves on to the next block. So, and it does this 80 times for SHA-1 for each block. So when all the blocks have finally been processed and the, the IV has been updated, you know, for every block this IV has been updated, the IV is the output of the hash. Um, and this is just the description in more symbolic terms for those that care. Um, so it's important to realize that the message is processed sequentially. That is, you know, it moves from the first block to the second block to the third block, and it doesn't do anything in reverse. Um, so if you manage to find a collision, and I'll define what a collision is in a few slides. If you manage to find a collision somewhere in the hash, anything after, if it's identical, if the two messages are identical, then they're going to produce the same output. You know, it doesn't move back. You know, it doesn't process in the, in the reverse direction when it's through. So, and you'll see better examples of this in coming slides. So a little bit about MD5. It was designed by Ron Rivest of RSA fame. Uh, Dr. Rivest is the R in RSA. Uh, it's specified in RFC 1321. It has a maximum input size of 2 to the 64 bits and produces an output size of 128 bits. The reason for the maximum input size will become clear as we discuss the attacks. Uh, if there wasn't a maximum input size, then a couple attacks would work and it would greatly reduce the strength of, of all these algorithms. MD5 is not a government standard, so it's not, it's not able to be used in any sort of government application. Um, MD5 is very broken, so if you are using it, it's best to switch now. Um, and it most certainly should not be included in, in, in any future deployments of anything. SHA-1 is a government standard. It's specified in NIST FIPS 180-2. The maximum input size of SHA-1 is also 2 to the 64 bits for reasons that will become clear. Its output size is 168 bit, 160 bits. Uh, the increase in output size is also one of the major factors in, in the security of hash functions. And absent any other attacks, SHA-1 is a stronger algorithm just for the simple fact that it has a, a larger output size. Uh, SHA-1 operates with 80 rounds. Uh, there are attacks that work on reduced round variants, as I'll show in a, in a little bit. Uh, no collisions have been found in SHA-1, despite what some of the tech news sites like to claim. Uh, the only thing that has happened is the security bounds on SHA-1 have been lowered, but they haven't been lowered enough to actually make people wear, you know, worry that their systems are are in trouble. The other important thing that I, I think I should define is what it means to break an algorithm. Uh, if you talk to different people, you know, their opinion on what it means for an algorithm to be broke varies pretty widely. Uh, the academic definition is, is, one definition I like is it, a break is anything that makes the algorithm uh, not perform as advertised. So if MD5 claims 128 bits of security, anything that makes it not produce 128 bits of security is a break. It doesn't matter if it's 127 bits of security. It's still totally computationally infeasible to actually do it. It's still a break. Uh, other people define a break as something that actually compromises security of systems. You know, a lot of these attacks, they're still so complex that you know, no attacker in the world could actually mount these. And, you know, thus your systems aren't in any jeopardy. So this is a basic problem, or a problem from basic probability theory. Anyone who's had an introduction to probability and stats course knows this problem, so I'm going to skip some of the math. I think it's covered probably in the first couple pages of every probability book. Uh, the question is, how many people need to be in a room for there to be a better than 50% chance that two people share the same birthday? Um, the number is actually surprisingly low. Well, I guess I shouldn't say surprisingly. Most people are surprised by the, the number. There only needs to be 23 people to be in a, a room for there to be a 50% chance to have the same birthday. Um, it's usually interesting at talks to actually do it, but I'm not because I know there's going to be a collision in this case because I actually know someone has the same birthday as me. So uh, I guess I stacked the deck with that one. Uh, the reason the number is so low is that you're actually looking for any possible collision. 
So if we were to actually do this, I would check my birthday against each person in the room, and then the next person would check his birthday against each person in the room. Uh, pretty soon, you know, there's a lot of pairings that, that happen, and this is why you have such a low number. Uh, it's actually, a lot of people confuse this. I'm not looking for another person that has the same birthday as me. I'm just looking for any two people that share the same birthday. Uh, the amount of work to find collisions and hash functions is roughly the square root of pi times m, where m is the output size, over 2, or it's about 2 to the n over 2. I guess I have a typo. Okay. Uh, some of the generic attacks against hash functions. You know, before we can talk about the specific recent ones, we need to, to discuss the, the generic attacks. Uh, the first attack, and to be cryptographically secure, a hash function has to resist all these properties at the very least. There's a few others that it needs to, needs to have, but these are most certainly the most important ones. Uh, the first attack is called a pre-image pre resistance. And that is, you know, this goes back to the one-way feature of hash functions. Uh, given an output of a hash function, you know, given the hash, it's computationally infeasible to find the input. To do this, it requires about 2 to the n work. Um, you know, in the case of SHA-1, this is 2 to the 160, which is such an astronomical number that you know, we don't have enough computing power in the world to actually do this. Uh, the next requirement is second preimage resistance, and this is given an input and an output h of x. It's computationally infeasible to find a second message, x prime, such that h of x equals h of x prime. So in this case, you're not actually looking for the input that caused it, but you're looking for a second input that, that produces the same hash. And I guess it's first important to, to point out that you know, with hash functions, there has to be collisions. You're, you're, when you look at SHA-1 and MD5, you know, you're mapping a message space of 2 to the 1. You, know, you can have messages up to 2 to the 64 bits in size, and you're mapping it down to only, only 160 bits. Uh, Dirichlet's pigeonhole principle, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. You know, if you have 10 pigeons and 9 birdhouses, and each pigeon is in a birdhouse, then one pigeon has to be in, or one birdhouse has to have more than one pigeon in it. You know, so given such a, a essentially infinite message space, you know, compressing it down to a finite size, you're, you have to have messages that go to the same output. Um, so this property simply states that it's not possible to find a second message that produces the, the same output. The third requirement, and usually the one that's violated the most, and in all the coming attacks, this is the one that has broken MD5 and reduced the strength of SHA-1, and that's collision resistance. Uh, in the case of just finding collisions like the birthday paradox, you're not looking for a specific input that causes a specific output. You're looking just for any two inputs that, that collide. You know, so you generate random, random inputs, and eventually with about 2 to the n over 2, in the case of SHA-1, about 2 to the 80 work, uh, you're going to find, you have a pretty good shot of finding two inputs that produce the same output. Uh, the next attack I'm going to talk about is a, a recent one, the, the Zhu multi-collision attack. And it's an, ex, an extension of the, the, collision, the generic collision attack. Um, since hash functions were, you know, since the beginning of hash function design, the question sort of was, you know, given 2 to the n over 2 work required to find a collision, how much work is required to find, say, three messages that collide, or you know, 16 messages that collide? Uh, Zhu recently addressed this in one of his papers, um, and he found that constructing 2 to the t collisions takes about two times t times 2 to the n over 2 operations, which you know, is not much. You know, finding, say, 16 collisions only takes slightly more work than finding two collisions. Um, you know, a lot of cryptographers believe that the work was actually a lot higher. Um, you know, because it's pretty hard to find two collisions, so finding three messages that collide, you know, it's probably a little bit more, you know, probably a lot more difficult, but actually it's not. Um, furthermore, uh, Zhu has, because of this attack, uh, the Zhu multi-collision attack, uh, cascading hash functions are not considered secure. And in a lot of schemes people have proposed, you know, the idea is, you take SHA-1 and MD5, 
And first you hash, hash the message with SHA-1, and then you append 